So we're going to further expand on the idea of coherence. So far, we've looked at a special case, self-coherence, where we were looking at one signal and a copy of that signal delayed in time and see how the two were correlating well with each other. This time, we're going to look at the mutual coherence between two distinct electric fields, which we are going to label E1 and E2. But just like for the self-coherence, to quantify how well correlated or how look-alike those two electric fields are, we are going to use the same um, normalized cross-correlation function trick. And so we are going to introduce this a new number, which we are going to call the degree of mutual coherence. And the notation for this is, typical, is um, traditionally to use the letter gamma. Um, because we are going to, um, we are looking at the, the mutual coherence between two uh, electric fields, we have to label it uh, using two indices. So here one and two, um, just to match the electric fields E1 and E2. And what that function is, is just like before, the, the time average correlation between E1 and E2 and normalized by the um, modulus of both um, E1 and E2. Now you know that, uh, because we've introduced these things before, that the time average modulus of E1 and E2 happens to be what we've called the um, intensity. And so uh, that normalization here just greatly simplifies. It's just the square root of the product of the intensity of those two um, fields. And the way we write this time averaging is by uh, integrating over time the cross product between the two fields. Just like before, it's a complex number uh, characterized by a modulus uh, whose magnitude is going to be uh, between 0 and 1. And um, how close to 1 that modulus is quantifies the capacity of a situation of, or an optical setup uh, to produce uh, the, um, the phenomenon of interferences. If we go back to the uh, case of self-coherence, uh, remember that we've said that, well, when two signals are um, slightly delayed in time, so one, uh, one signal and its copies are slightly delayed in time, the the self-coherence can be quite strong, but with enough delay, the two signals look so different from each other that they are going not to correlate at all. Well, imagine what's going to happen if you go and look at the mutual coherence of two distinct uh, sources. And uh, this is typically um, like a simulation of what um, uh, the electric field would look like over a very small time scale of about you know, 10 to the minus 13 seconds. So you can see individual packets um, pop in here and there. And we're very close to the uh, situation where we had um, two signals that are so delayed in time that they don't look, a lot, uh, they don't look alike at all. Um, if you want to quantify this, we are going to compute the actual uh, self-coherence and mutual coherence curves. And uh, the red curve that you have here, you may recognize it because it corresponded to the um, self-coherence function we saw earlier. Um, that is the coherence between one signal and itself delayed in time. The blue curve in comparison uh, corresponds to the mutual coherence function between two different uh, electric fields coming from two different distinct sources. And uh, you see that that mutual coherence function never gets um, significantly higher than, well, it's very close to zero. And this is, keep in mind that this is only by looking at the time scale of about 10 to the minus 13 seconds, which is an exposure time so short that uh, we can never actually reach it. Uh, typical exposure times in astronomy are going to be of the order of a second or maybe, maybe down to a millisecond, which means that we're not going to average hundreds of events, but actually billions. And so that, that, this averaging effect is going to make that 
the mutual coherence function is um, essentially zero. <clears throat> so now if we think about the uh, coherence of two natural light sources, and uh, here we're going to slight, uh, slowly transition toward our application, which is actual astronomy. Um, so we have, uh, we can think of two natural light sources as two different stars, or uh, two parts of the same star, the, the left part and the right one, or the top and the bottom, or the center of something else. Or, so, but easiest to think about two uh, distinct stars, S1 and S2. <clears throat> now you realize that the events in S1 and S2 that give birth to the wave packets that uh, make up the bulk of uh, the electric fields E1 and E2, uh, they have no reason to be synchronized at all. I mean, they are different objects or different locations of the same object. The local temperature may be different. The, the, uh, the There's no reason for the, 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 the wave packets to be synchronized. And uh, um, so if we look at one uh, receiver trying to mix the two signals E1 and E2, uh, well, just like we saw it uh, in our previous case here, we, we just have to accept the fact that uh, we are never going to be able to measure any uh, uh, mutual coherence uh, significantly different from zero. And that is a very important fact. The, the, one of the most important pieces of uh, information you want to keep in mind in the context of interferometry is that the light of distinct astronomical sources will never interfere with each other. Um, one way to formulate this is to say that sources are going to be spatially incoherent. They are never going to produce interferences. On the other hand, we had self-coherence. If two observing stations look at one object, then the field emitted by that one source is going to um, is is going to reach the stations, and if the distance that uh, links those stations to the source is essentially the same, and uh, we've even established a criterion for this, it has to be the same to within this parameter that we introduced before called the coherence length. And then um, in such circumstances, the wave packets are going to reach the two stations at the same time. And so uh, if you try and mix them and uh, look for a coherence signal, uh, the, in this case, the coherence signal is going to be always systematically different from zero. If you combine those two ideas together, the two important facts, I repeat, are going to be that sources are spatially incoherent. The field of distinct origins are never going to, inter to interfere with each other. The second fact is that point sources are self-coherent. Um, what that means is that when you perform uh, observations, you're going to observe that every point source is going to produce its own set of interferences. <clears throat> we can somehow summarize this, um, this situation by, by this plot here, where we have more than two, more than one source, so here simply two, that uh, are being observed by two stations simultaneously. The light of the two is never going to interfere. However, the light collected by um, P1 and P2, the two stations on S1 is going to interfere, and the light collected by the same two stations on S2 is going to interfere. These are really the two extreme scenarios. On the other hand, you have zero interference or zero coherence, and on the other hand, you have uh, perfect coherence. Of course, the interesting situations will arise when we are measuring intermediate values of coherence. 
And this is the whole business of um, stellar interferometry. You want to measure the coherence of astronomical sources. We're going to distinguish two types of sources, things that we will refer to as point sources or perfectly coherent sources, and sources that are different from that, that differ from that. Um, like um, a resolved object uh, with, a, um, with a companion, for example. A point source is always going to produce perfect coherence if we manage to uh, make the light reach a detector to within the coherence length. <clears throat> and so any departure from the um, ideal coherence response we should be getting according to our theory or the model of our instrument is going to be a diagnostic that is going to tell us that our target is not just a point source. Now, being able just to say point source or not is not that exciting, really. Uh, we'd like to be able to do a little bit more, and you can actually do more. But And you need to look for a general relation that uh, is going to relate coherence measurements to the structure of the object. And one such relation exists. It is called the Wenzeger zernike theorem. That is the result, the, the most fundamental theorem, uh, that relates coherence measurements to structures um, that describe the object, uh, a function that would describe the object you're, you're observing. And uh, we're going to see what that theorem is, and we're going to apply it many times over the rest of this course.